When Luke sat down to pen his gospel about the life, death, and purpose of Jesus, an itinerant Jewish rabbi born into obscurity in rural Israel, he did it with the mastery of a Hollywood director. Skipping past Jesus' birth story for a moment to his breakout story here in chapter 3, Luke sets it up as a drone shot. Imagine that we're first in Rome, high above one of the palaces of the emperor, then zooming in on Tiberius eating a peeled grape or ordering an execution. Now suddenly we're in the breezy resort town of Caesarea Philippi, flying down to watch Pontius Pilate pouring over piles of the emperor's money. Then suddenly we're hurtling off to the Galilee, the Garden of Israel, where we see the double-crossing Herod Antipas in some intrigue. And finally, we fly to Jerusalem, the busy capital and holy center of Israel, to watch the high priest and his emeritus engaged in some elaborate religious rite. At every location, we expect to see something extraordinary, history in the making. But every time the camera takes us back up, 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 and finally pans over to the wilderness, the middle of nowhere, an empty, dusty stage. Then Luke drops the mic with the coolness of a no-drama Obama because it was not in the halls of power nor to the people who occupied them that the word of God arrived. The word arrived in no man's land to a nobody, John, the son of Zechariah, and not just the words from God, but the word of God. This past week, the five living American presidents gathered in the National Cathedral in Washington for a funeral. Four of them recited the Apostles' Creed. Together they intoned the ancient words, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day he rose again. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. Pop Quiz Church, what he were they talking about? Anyone think they know the answer? Hands up if you know the answer. Rick. Jesus! Rick gets to go to the coffee hour table first today. Some people notice that the sitting president did not say these words alongside his peers. This is perhaps significant, perhaps not. Maybe he's not really a Christian and he didn't want to be a hypocrite. <clears throat> Maybe he abhors saying things in unison because he's an iconoclast. He's an exception to the rules. Maybe he was tired. Maybe he doesn't know how to read. <laughs> okay, I've already devoted too much airtime to this line of wondering and this particular emperor. What I'd rather wonder at is this. When Luke wrote this chapter in 70 AD, he lifts up the name Pontius Pilate as a way of putting a pin in history for Jesus. Pontius Pilate is the famous one at the time, and Luke is trying to get traction for his listeners by celebrity name dropping. Listen, 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 said Luke. There is something really important that happened. Someone who is more important than all those other wannabes, someone who is going to change, has changed the world forever. It's amazing when you think about it that way. 2,000 years later, the only reason most of us know the name Pontius Pilate is because of Jesus. There's nobody from nowhere. Even non-Christians know Jesus' whole name, including his middle name, or at least his middle initial, H, <laughs> but nobody knows Pilate's middle name. Hold that thought. 
What is perhaps even more extraordinary is how four of the currently and formerly most powerful men in the world submitted to the phrase, he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I wonder if they thought about it as they said it, really thought about every decision they'd made with the power and responsibility available to them, every sin of commission or omission, not just as president, but as husband, father, son, neighbor, human. Even now, the president they were mourning was facing his maker and answering for his life and choices. Did they really think about what it meant that Jesus was promised to come back and hold us all accountable for what we have done and what we have left undone? It's Advent, which means arrival. Advent starts in a shattered way, much like the hymn we began worship with today. In the waning light of the year, we dust off the apocalyptic texts of the Bible and read that Jesus is coming, not as the sweet little baby we'll celebrate on Christmas Eve, but as judge and jury. Luke's long windup gets us ready for the words that John quotes from Isaiah. Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth. If we are unhappy with the way things are, if our paths have been rocky and perilous, if life has been a steep climb, this is good news. If we have been wronged in life, waiting for justice and disappointed so far, it is good news that Jesus is coming to level the playing field and take some names. It might delight us to imagine the president who didn't say the words of the creed facing this Jesus. But when we review the footage, not C-SPAN's record from the halls of power, but from our own lives, we remember that we too have made mistakes. Not on the same scale, perhaps, but history is not just made on thrones. We have history too, and we shall answer for it. When we think about God coming, really coming back, do we welcome God or fear God? What do we expect when we are expecting God? And John and Isaiah's language of what is needed for God to come back is so violent. For us to truly make a smooth way for God takes earth movers, heavy machinery, a tearing of earth. We have heaped up mountains of waste that are killing the planet. We have enabled valleys of death in our systems of commerce and justice. But in our personal lives too, we have built crooked paths that may make it hard for God to get from there to here? What obstacles have we put between us and God? How do we begin to fix any of it, to make it smooth, to make a way out of no way? It's so easy to break things. It's so hard to fix things. Last week, my daughter Carmen and I went to Castro Valley to pick out a Christmas tree we planned to meet my sister and little nephew at the tree farm, and on the way, we stopped for a quick hike in the hills. We were only gone from the car for about 25 minutes, and when we got back, we found that a window had been smashed and the car had been rifled through. The only thing they stole was a small saw for the Christmas tree, worth maybe $10 if fenced. Four days later, I finally got the window fixed for $400. I tried to take it in stride. 
A smashed car window every three years is the price of admission to the Bay Area, I told Carmen. When we live in such extreme income inequality, there will always be those who attempt to level the playing field, and frankly, who can blame them. But I still felt angry, violated, and irritated that I would have to drive around with winter air assaulting me until I could get it fixed and a car full of broken glass. A few minutes later, we were at the tree farm. We found the perfect tree and we wrestled it inside the car amidst the mountains of glass and we poured ourselves some celebratory hot chocolate from the thermos I had brought. My three-year-old nephew promptly dropped his full cup and hot chocolate flew everywhere. He looked down, looked up, and evading further judgment announced loudly, it's okay, it's just a mess. <laughs> that hot chocolate and those six words are a parable. Was my nephew all of us? Offering ourselves cheap grace for where we have messed up before God can get in a word? Was he God, full of gentleness and amazing grace, when our own clumsiness and cosmic forces make a mess in our lives? Was he Jesus, reminding us to laugh and take a wider view, even when all seems lost? It's okay, it's just a mess. Or is it a Brene Brown meme or the title of Anne Lamott's next book? God is sometimes described in the Bible as coming like, like a thief in the night, breaking and entering our lives. Anytime something gets broken, it is worth asking, where is the blessing in the breaking? You know, when the technician came and fixed my window, he found my prescription sunglasses worth $200. <laughs> and I figure the lesson I learned was worth the other 200 John says that for God to get to us, the mountains must be leveled, the valleys raised up, the way made easy. Is this our work or God's? John starts with an imperative, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. I think it's a little too late for us to make our paths straight. I like them a little queer or a lot queer anyhow. So this is somewhat our work to make the paths, if not straight, at least easy for God to get to us on. But then John shifts to the passive future indicative every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough ways made smooth this is God at work God meeting us halfway or more than halfway and for what purpose is God coming back as if God could ever really leave in the first place is it to judge or to love? Or in the way of true love, to reckon with us, to level with us, to move earth, to give us a way back to each other? I know that the world is broken and blessed. I know that every day history is made, not in the halls of power, but in every human life that every act of tenderness, decency, forgiveness, peacemaking, provocation of joy or justice brings us closer to God. And I believe that what John said at the end is true and coming truer all the time, that all flesh shall see salvation. Amen.